So I'm technically calling this study uh, part two because the previous study, um, I kind of divided in half because I had far more material than I had time for. But uh, the handout that I sent to you uh, via email uh, is part two, and I'll get to that in a moment. I, I, there was a couple more slides from last week that I just want to touch on for a second. And again, we're using this idea of an intersection uh, where different influences converge together. Um, and so when we think about identity, when we think about culture, and when we think about people's desire to control those two things, uh, there is always the uh, potential for a crash. So having said that, what we've been trying to do is first talk a little bit about, about identity. And I've given you uh, uh, some different biblical stories in the previous couple of weeks that we've looked at um, where the identity of the Jewish people was um, often tried to be changed by people like uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and so on and so forth. Tonight's study uh, doesn't have a whole lot of scripture attached to it, but I think it will help us to understand the scripture when we think about everyone is born into a culture. And so we said last week that maybe one way we could define culture is what you see on the screen here. Uh, culture is that shared uh, personal and learned life experiences of a group of people who have this common set of values, norms, and traditions. And usually that's what makes uh, a particular person comfortable with somebody else. And there is a listing there of different things that we use as cu uh, cultural uh, def uh, definitions, whether it's age or gender or sexual identity or geographical areas and so forth. So the one thing that we were starting to talk a little bit about last week is how culture is passed down from one generation to another. And um, we are not born with a knowledge of the culture. We learn that. We learn that in our family, in our schools, and uh, our religious institutions, and all that type of thing. So we are kind of indoctrinated into a particular way of looking at life. And when we think about that, we associate certain symbols with it that um, we identify with. And uh, we might say there's kind of a cultural code that we learn uh, when we are young. And as we um, move up through our age brackets, as we grow, um, that, that code becomes kind of our safe place. And so as you see on the slide here, when you have acquired a certain amount of knowledge, skill, attitudes, or values, then you are accepted into a culture. If you uh, do not accept those type of things, you're looked upon with suspicion. But there's a term here. When we go through that, we are enculturated. And this enculturation allows for us to successfully participate in that culture and be accepted. And when we need to learn a second culture, like many immigrants need to do, um, that second culture is called um, acculturation. So you have enculturation, the culture we're born into, but the one that we have to learn so that we will function well within the society that we find ourselves. So having said that, you can understand how culture can either promote unity or uh, it can create division. And I think that's what we see a lot of right now in the division in our country is a cultural division more than anything else. So culture can, can, uh, can promote this unity in the sense of you have a shared experience, you have uh, a certain shared set of values and so forth. But when the culture is so vastly different, and especially when immigrants come into the country and they bring with them the culture that they grew up with and that they are enculturated in, um, that often then makes people that are already here uncomfortable. And so that then can produce division, such as let's build a wall um, and that type of thing. Let's keep these people out. But somehow, and I think this is the norm in in most people's experiences, 
every culture has co-cultures that need to, to somehow survive alongside of each other. So whether it's in the United States or it's in England, or you have a variety of subcultures that somehow have to learn how to get along, which means you need to know a little bit about their practices and their traditions and symbols as well. So sometimes those co-cultures can mesh together pretty effortlessly, um, but sometimes there's a big clash over them. And so we find this, especially uh, the more diverse a culture becomes in a particular country, the more tension there is and sometimes there are certain cultural expectations that are placed upon people. Why can't they speak English? That's what we speak here in the United States. Well, they don't know English, okay? You don't learn a language overnight. It's very difficult. And a lot of times we don't have the patience. Um, and we would expect that patience of us if we were, let's say, moving to Italy and we have to learn Italian or something, I mean, yeah, we would say, well, be patient with me. It's going to take time to learn your culture and your language and so forth. So it can create unity, uh, but it more often than not can create a lot of tension and ultimately division. So here is this enduring problem. And the enduring problem is how does Christ relate to that? When you have a huge diversity of cultures, and I guess I could have attached a scripture reference here if you were to look to Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel, you have a diversity of language, you have a diversity of culture. That, how does Christ relate to these cultures? And that's been a subject of conversation for many, many years. Um, and it's not just culture, it's religion too. So in most cultures, um, religion is somehow blended uh, within that. And sometimes they are indistinguishable uh, between the two. And that's not only true of our country, which claims to be a Christian nation, which um, I, has, I have my suspicions that that's not totally accurate. But um, what we find is that that becomes the identity, whether it is uh, Hinduism or Buddhism or uh, Islam, it's in cultured, uh, it, the religion and the culture itself is intermeshed. And when these two things emerge, it's very easy then to see how religion can become nationalistic. So um, nationalism, our culture is the best culture. And I'm sure you've heard people say, you know, the United States, the greatest country on the face of the earth. Well, that's a very nationalistic perspective. Uh, so what you find is, well, we might be the greatest in some areas, but not in other areas. We're certainly not the greatest when it comes to mass shootings. We have a bunch of them. The rest of the world doesn't. So uh, the, the idea of we're the best usually gets ingrained in nationalism and, um, it, and somehow uses religion as a part of that. So down at the bottom of the screen here, you're going to notice um, the way that this topic has been discussed over the years is um, how does Christ relate to culture? So you'll find within our own nation, um, you have pretty uh, hardcore Christians that will say, well, Christ is against everything in culture. Um, and so you need to reject it. And it's almost as if you retreat, and there's examples of that, obviously the Amish border on that, okay? You pull away from the culture at large, you identify as your community uh, by itself, and, and you reject the things of culture. That's why, you, you know, they don't use electricity and they uh, use horses rather than vehicles and all those types of things. Secondly, you have the Christ of culture, and that's kind of a, the other end of the extreme, and that is, Christ can be found in all cultures everywhere. And so you'll have some um, literature that talks about the universal Christ. And the idea behind that is Christ can be found in every culture if you look for it. Thirdly is Christ as the transformer of culture. 
Uh, Christians are the hands and feet of Jesus uh, in the culture to try to portray a better way than a fallen culture, a culture that is often uh, detrimental and dangerous. And then finally, Christ is conditioned by culture. Now, this is the most dangerous of all, of all to think that Christ is um, American and white is to then take our culture and what we deem as uh, what we love about culture, um, and I might add to that a straight white American Jesus, okay, that uh, this is uh, how uh, Christ uh, is within the scripture, and the truth of the matter is we bring our culture and impose it upon the Bible rather than understanding there's a great diversity of different cultures that are in the Bible. And that's what makes the Bible so difficult to read and interpret properly. And that's why there's all kinds of diversity that makes interpretation and harmony between passages difficult as well. So let me stop there. Uh, that's kind of a wrap up from last week a little bit, but do you have any thoughts or questions or comments? So here's some examples of conditioning, cultural conditioning that you'll find in the biblical text. So I think we're all familiar with the name of God, Elohim, right? Uh, it's a, a name that is found, especially in the older books of the Old Testament. But an older name that's found within Canaanite culture is El. And so what you're going to find is El is sort of a, um, a precursor to Elohim that is found in Genesis. So you even see Israel uh, and their name for God has been appropriated from a different culture. Secondly, another name for God, Yahweh, uh, is found in the Old Testament. And in Psalm 8, 68, verse 4, uh, it says, Yahweh rides on the clouds. Well, that's an allusion to kind of a military warrior uh, image of the Canaanite storm god, Baal, uh, who rides upon the clouds. So you see even the cultures that you find in the Bible will, will sometimes absorb some of the other cultures around them. In Genesis 1, God establishes order in the cosmos by dividing and defeating the waters of chaos, Genesis chapter 1. Well, you have that same exact story in the Mesopotamian, Egyptian, and Canaanite creation stories. So that, that's interesting. It's another part of Genesis. Genesis talks about a massive flood to punish the violence that humanity has brought into the world, but that's not the only place you find it. It's also found in other religious literature of the ancient Near East as well. And then finally, like the gods of the surrounding nations, Yahweh is often portrayed as a warrior who fights on behalf of his people, and that would be Israel. Well, that's not an unusual thing. That's the same thing you find in other cultures. You have gods that fight on behalf of their people, whether it's the Philistines or the Egyptians or those type of things. So these are some examples, I think, of how culture conditions and what comes first, the chicken or the egg, when it comes to the Bible. Is this first found in the Bible and other cultures appropriated, or is it found in other cultures and the biblical writers appropriated? Does that make sense? So that's a difficult thing. Uh, that takes a lot of uh, research by scholars to figure those influences out. Any thoughts or comments there? I have a question for you, Larry. You yeah. have um, Baal. You're saying he's a storm god? Mm -hmm. I, I thought he was the fertility god, as in plants growing things and maybe even people fertility. Did he wear a lot of hats? He wore a lot of hats. I mean, when you think about fertility, you have the fertility of the earth thus water, uh, right. crops, that type of thing. But then you have the fertility of human beings. And in the Old Testament, that God is Ashtaroth. 
So you remember a couple of times uh, the nation of Israel uh, still worship Ashtara poles. Do you remember that at all? So yeah. they would set up Ashtara poles. Well, that was the superstition that if they continued to worship Ashtara, uh, the women would be fruitful and have kids. So um it's you're kind of right there's a fertility there but i think Baal is more related to the fertility of the earth and okay. and the ability to produce crops meals all that type of thing but if you look up ashtara you'll find that that's related specifically to the uh fertility of women and the ability okay. to have large families other comments? Okay, so now we're to tonight's handout. Okay, so this is where we want to begin uh, part two of this study. Now, based upon what we said from the last two weeks, when we talk about culture, you can't escape where you find yourself. Um, you're born into a culture. You're born into a time and space. And it's there that you learn about life. So point number one here is people have no other way to talk about God other than the language that they have been given by their culture. So if you were born someplace else on the face of the earth rather than in the United States, um, you would look at God differently because your culture has conditioned you to look at God that way. So that might mean in Hinduism, it's not one God, there is a plurality of gods. Or within Islam, Allah and his prophet Muhammad presents a very different portrait of God than Jesus does. Allah is um, a God that would be very difficult uh, to please, much along the lines of the portraits sometimes we see in the Old Testament. And you'll find a lot more rituals that are attached to it. The way that you're going to please this God is to pray five times a day. And so you better make sure that you do it and don't miss it, that type of thing. Uh, and then you get corrupt teachings that often filter in as well. And that's where um, jihadists and terrorists that um, bring to their idea uh, that if they kill the infidels, then God will give them a higher place in heaven. And then there's the idea that they'll have 70 virgins in the next life and, uh, and all that type of stuff. So now if you have been told that your whole life, and then you've been indoctrinated in that particular culture, you're just going to naturally receive it, right? You're not going to question it. That's just the way it is. It's only when uh, you're introduced to something else that you begin to say, wait a minute here, there might be another way of looking at God or culture or life or the equality of the sexes or whatever it may be. So when you're reading the Bible, you have to assume every page that you open you are finding an encultured people. That's the way they look at life because that's where they were born. Now that explains why there's such a diverse portrait of God from Old Testament to New Testament. You don't have one unified, stable, unchanging portrait of God. And the reason is the culture is much different. So you have a nomadic group of people that come out of Egypt, they begin to develop their religion, and they carry with them Egyptian influences. And as they carry with them Egyptian influences, some of that will also seep into the way they look at God. Same with the Philistines and the Babylonians and the Assyrians and all that. So with these diverse portraits of God, you have then things that are attached to that God that are morally questionable. So when you find God saying, wipe out the Canaanites, don't, I mean, their livestock, their women, their children, and their men, wipe them all out. Well, the way to get to that is, is that 
reflective of what God wants, or is that reflective of the way they view God as a warrior? And the only way that God can uh, create land for this people that's identifying as the ones that wrestle with God, that's Israel, is to see this God in a tribal way. And usually that involves violence. Now, this will shake you up a little bit because you, most people have been told all their life that inspiration of the scripture prevents that from happening. So you need to take every verse with equal force. And I'm suggesting that's not a good way to look at inspiration. A better way of looking at inspiration is to understand what is represented in the scripture reflects their time and their culture, and it is beneficial to us. So 2 Timothy 3.16, these things are instructional, uh, correctional, all those type of things, because as we read the story, as we reflect upon it, there's things that we can imitate, and my goodness, there are things we need to reject that are there. Does that make sense to every, everyone? So when we read the scripture, we are faced with this troubling data that is, is difficult to reconcile with the God that is portrayed in the New Testament and reflected upon by Jesus as the Abba Father, the one who loves, the one who heals, the one who provides grace. And I think when one viewpoint is accepted over another without Jesus being the ultimate, and here I'm going to give to you my, my prejudice on this, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of what God is like. And if that's true, these other viewpoints of God are reflecting cultures and conditions that we need to be careful of. All right, does that make sense to everybody? That should help in terms of you know, when somebody says, well, hey, God is a violent God, just look, read the Old Testament, right? Well, okay, fine, but is that prescriptive or descriptive? I think it's more descriptive of a culture and how they viewed God than saying this gives us justification to invade, to kill, to, um, you know, um, you know, obtain land. And that's why earlier I said, when we call the United States a Christian nation, yeah, it has Christian influences. And yeah, Christianity is the civic religion. But when it takes land away from the Native Americans, when it sets them on the trail of tears, when it uses African slaves to build it, you must and I must understand that that there's not a there's not nothing Christian about that. There's nothing Christian about that, and yet the name of God is often used for manifest destiny, uh, you know, and controlling territory and that type of thing. That um, so we'll get to that because here's what I want to do tonight, the rest of our time, and then in the weeks ahead, here's what I want to follow up with. So if we're going to understand culture and its influence upon us, then we need to understand, first of all, what the making of the modern mindset. So that's where we're going to go in a second. And then a follow-up to that is what is the making of the American mindset? So that's kind of where I'm going over the next few weeks. But before I continue, do you have some thoughts or questions there? Okay, so understand the Bible is to primarily understand their time and how we view the world isn't always how other identities and cultures understood the world. So um, some of you have traveled um, in, to different parts of the world. And when you experience a different cult, uh, country, you've experienced a different culture. They just don't look at life through the same lenses that we do. And it's not right or wrong, it's just different. And when we say, when we understand that, what we have to understand is um, 
we must appreciate that culture grows out of the roots of a history of people, how they got started. And that's where the story of Israel is so fascinating. Here is this nomadic people that are on the move in the wilderness for about 40 years before they actually get a land of their own. Well, that's conditioned them. Okay, that and it's reflected in how they experience life and how they look at God. So when we don't know who we are and how our history and our particular context shapes us, here's the danger. We can easily start to read into the Bible our culture, not theirs. Does that make sense? And when we read our culture into it, then <laughs> we often read things into the scripture that's just not there. It's not there. It's not American. It's not a Western mindset, that type of thing. Comments there? Okay, I wanna explain this for a little bit because this will become the setup for the next few weeks. So on your handout is this uh, slide and I wanna explain it using a verse out of First Chronicles. So. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, it's talking about the reign of David. And David's followers um, are following him and engaging in battle. And as they do so, what we're told is about David's army in chapter 12, verse 23. And excuse me, some of the divisions within the uh, army of David. But there's an interesting... Um, little comment, just one verse. So you have the division among the tribes and how many soldiers are from each of the tribes in chapter 12 of First Chronicles. But one particular tribe, Issachar, uh, there's this addendum that is, is uh, made about this particular tribe. So in verse 32, it says, of Issachar, those who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That's a, that's a fascinating comment. Somehow this tribe, Issachar, understood the uh, culture and the times that they found themselves in. Now that's not to say that the other tribes didn't, but for whatever reason, this has been singled out by the author, that um, the tribe of Issachar understood their times and they knew what they ought to do. So what is it that they understood? Well, they understood their world and the influences around them, the potential dangers of the empires that David was fighting and so forth. Now, I want to take that same principle for a second. Okay. Those who had the understanding of the times knew what uh, they should do. Now, in order to understand our times and our culture and our influence, you need to look at three segments of a timeline here, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. Now, pre-modern is before 1500, before the days of the Reformation. And it's interesting that after Constantine made Christianity the state religion in 314 AD, all of a sudden, the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope began to uh, kind of be co-authorities uh, within the culture. And in this pre-modern day, you have ecclesiastical authority, bishops and the Pope, and you have political authority like kings. And so people looked to these two institutions and because they were primarily illiterate, um, they were dependent upon these two influences uh, to tell them what to do. And yet it was a very religious time. So the focus is on God in the pre-modern era. And that is, okay, they're telling us certain things about what God is like and what he demands, whether it's true or not, because 
within the Catholic Church, there's a lot of traditions that develop that you don't find in the Bible. You just can't find them there. But they look to the traditions and the uh, papal authority to tell them what to do. And all of that is reflected in their view of God until about 1500. And so there's a shift that begins to take place. And the shift is first, the Reformation comes along and began to look at what was going on, the sale of indulgences and other uh, forms of um, abuse of authority. Uh, and there began to be some pushback on that by individuals like Martin Luther and other reformers. But at the same time, this is becoming what is known as the Renaissance. So in this particular pre-modern era, this era was not at all interested in some of the classic literature like Aristotle and Plato and some of the great philosophers because most of the society was illiterate. But when you get to this era to about 1500, the Renaissance, and I'll have more to show you in some of the other slides, they began to take an interest again in some of the classic literature of the Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato. It is also called the Enlightenment because all of a sudden mankind's mind is expanded and opens up and begins to look at the world differently than in the pre-modern era. So that then leads into the modern era. And when you accompany the Reformation on the religious side, the re Renaissance on the arts and culture side, and then the Enlightenment, it will lead to the Industrial and Scientific Revolution. So you have a lot of developments during the modern era, and the focus is no longer so much on God. Now the focus is on the potential of humanity. Okay, does that make sense? The mind and the ability to invent and all that type of stuff. Now, we come to close to our own day and age. Around the year 2000, the term postmodern starts to emerge in, in the literature. And the postmodern era begins to struggle with the earth and some of the crises that is found by um, some of the abuses that are found in the industrial and scientific revolution. And so you have an ecological crisis. Global warming starts to come into the conversation. You have economic crisis in the sense that those who have a handle on the industries, a lot of times can create great wealth. And so you have people that get very rich and then people that become very poor, okay? Or, or at least an um, economic gap. Then you have equality crisis. So um, it comes to a head around year 2000, but it's been building through uh, the civil rights movement uh, for equal equality among the races, um, also equality among the sexes and equality in marriage uh, as recently as 2016 in the, um, the Equality uh, of Marriage Act. But here's what the postmodern era is dealing with. Global problems, pollution, global warming, different things like that, and the crises that it creates upon humanity. So if you have global warming and you can't grow crops and people can't feed their family, the potential starvation and other things like that begins to grow as well. So it's not just us, it's the entire earth has this um, effect by kind of ignoring and again, a lot of these problems can come all the way from the pre-modern era through the modern era to our own era. And, that, and by that, I mean, so a misapplication of go into the world and subdue it. You know, the 
the commission given to Adam, okay? Go and, and rule over the world. If that's mistaken to think, just use it and abuse it any way you want rather than take care of it. Well, then it can lead all the way from the pre-modern through the modern when you have machinery and industry and all this type of thing and not taking care of the earth or polluting different parts of the world that it's no longer inhabitable or you can't grow crops or whatever it may be or the cutting down of the rainforest because you want lumber and it affects the quality of air and, and all those type of things leads to a lot of these crises. And we're just starting to get, I guess, a handle on some of these things. I'm not very well versed in this, but you can, if you want to hold on to humanity rather than the earth, you can go, well, hey, that's not real. Global warming's not real. Well, okay, are you going to listen to the scientific community or not? You know, or you can ignore it because you want to hold on to a particular cultural mindset. So we'll come back uh, to this slide several times, and we're going to fill some things in as we continue to go along. But do you have any questions? Hopefully that's clear enough that it's understandable. Do you, do you have any questions or comments? That is big, uh, a big, broad brush strokes. I understand it's a lot more complex than this. Okay, I understand that. But, you know, we can only bite so much and try to get a, a, at least a, a start to understand it. Any, any thoughts there? Okay, so let's come back. And for the rest of our time tonight, I wanna talk about pre-modern society. So the term that is often associated with the pre-modern uh, society or culture is also called the Dark Ages, um, medieval times. Now, the Roman Empire um, fell around 410 AD, but this religious structure, the Roman Catholic Church, was pretty well set in place by the time they lost their their um, political power. Uh, and of course, the Roman Empire still has an influence in that the culture of the Roman Empire still has influence even to this day in a lot of things. But as far as the empire that ruled all the way from India to Britain, that starts to subside around 410 AD. But during this time, the rule of the Roman Catholic Church became very powerful and very wealthy. The problem becomes you have the power of the church and the power of the empires, I put in plural, over the next thousand years, that's a long time, over the next thousand years, they're going to fight for power, or as in this, the title of this study, control. Okay, so identity, culture, and control. Now, the church and state as a whole is identified as Christendom and rather than Islam or Hinduism or something like that. But you'll find that the church under the Pope and bishops, as well as the kings, all have this influence that affects ethics and knowledge and authority and identity within these empires. So don't you find it fascinating? A beloved translation of the Bible, the King James version of the Bible is named after a king. Isn't that interesting in 1611? So um, you see these two are kind of intermeshed, okay? So the populace, the average common uh, citizen during this period of time is primarily illiterate. They can't read, they can't write. So they're told what to do. The primary educational system for adults uh, during this period of time is monasteries. So um, men, not women, but men primarily will go into a monastery, they'll dedicate themselves um, to study and learning and language. Now, that then turns into some of the translations, uh, uh, not translations, interpretations 
of the Bible. So you have things that start to emerge within the Roman Catholic Church that are loosely based on the Bible, but it's not really a primary teaching. For example, Roman Catholic Church has a much different viewpoint on the Lord's table than Protestants do. So for Protestants, uh, the Lord's table is primarily a remembrance, a reflection upon Jesus' death on the cross. Within Catholic theology, uh, if you listen closely, when uh, the sacrament is given, they talk about this becoming the body and blood of our Lord, so that there is some type of mystical transformation that takes place. Well, is that found in the Bible? No. But it's close. When Jesus institutes the Lord's table, he says, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. So if you take it very literally, it's easy to see how to get to that tradition that this becomes the body and blood of Christ. Okay. So that's what I mean by kind of loosely based association to traditions. Okay. Some of that then also includes other books that aren't found in a typical Protestant Bible. For example, the Apocrypha that's in Catholic Bibles. There's a few verses and a loose tradition that's attached to that can create beliefs in purgatory and other things like that. You have also um, the perpetual um, uh, sequence of of popes and that type of thing too. So there's all kinds of traditions and beliefs that are not in the Bible primarily, but you can use the Bible, does that make sense, to, to try to create certain traditions. What you will not find during this era though, is they do not study the great thinkers, Plato and Aristotle, and others like that. So any any thoughts there? All right. So this is fair or unfair. This is called the Dark Ages. And it lasts from 476 AD to the beginning of the 14th century. There are some advances, uh, but not a whole lot. There's a lot of hardship during the Dark Ages. Uh, you have famine, you have pandemics such as the Black Death. Um, there's a lot of war. Um, there's knights and kings and crusades. You know what I'm saying? So there's, there's a lot of things that are going on. Some historians will say we, we need to dial this term back, the Dark Ages, because um, there is little appreciation for the Greek and Roman philosophers. And yet at the same time, not everything was negative, that there was some advancements that were being made. So take that for what it's worth. I mean, you'll have different, just like anything in any field of study, you have different people that have different uh, viewpoints on this. So what happens is during the modern era, you begin to see that there are certain people that are gonna to start to rise above that era, that pre-modern era. And they begin to question the authority of both the church and the state. And the power over the people starts to break down primarily uh, because of the enlightenment, the learning of people. And as uh, you have some of the great um, individual uh, and I'll mention a couple of them in a moment, that they begin to challenge a lot of what has been told to the populace. And they began to focus on the potential of humanity and a lot of the great inventions and, and some of the things that we take for granted, such as one example, in 1450, you have the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg. And can you imagine a world where you didn't have the printing press? no books, no newspapers, no magazines, that type of thing could be distributed to the masses. We take that for granted. Now we've moved beyond that. There's not as, uh, as many newspapers and magazines because of the internet. But nonetheless, 
you can imagine uh, society would have never developed like it did without the help of the invention of the printing press. Thoughts there? So Gutenberg and others individuals are beginning to push back and you begin to enter into modernity. And it's within modernity, you have three influences, three influences that, and there's many, 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 many more than this. But it seems as though these three influences kickstarted the era of uh, the, the, the modern era. One is Florence, Italy. So here's Florence, Italy. Here you see up kind of in the middle of Italy here. And uh, it is there in Florence, you have a republic and you don't have knights and kings as you do in other parts of the world. So it's, it's less hierarchical and it is a, an area because of certain families that had wealth that they helped finance the arts. Okay, they began putting money into the arts. And uh, because it's a republic, it allowed more free trade and thinking to take place. And where there is trade, you have crossover of cultures, right? So if you're gonna bring something in from China or Turkey or those type of things, you are being introduced to other cultures. So there's a bigger world that's, that's starting to develop be, and it begins in Florence. Uh, and that's why uh, the people that have been to Florence, uh, I understand that it's just a phenomenal area to visit because of the culture and stuff. Um, have any of you guys been to Florence at all? No. So it, it's, it'd be an interesting place to see. Second big influence. So there is this man named Francesco Petrarca, and he lived between 1304 and 1374, so he didn't have a real long life, but 70 years, and he was a scholar and a poet, and he's often called in literature Petrarch, and he becomes, through his writings, he becomes um, part of the early Renaissance in Italy, and he is known as the father of humanism. Now, humanism, you know, by evangelical church, oh, humanism, it's all bad. There's that pushback again uh, that, you know, this doesn't mean ungodly things. It means the potential of human beings. That's, you know, humanism. Now, here's where he made an advancement. He traveled the world collecting all kinds of manuscripts from some of the ancient writers like Homer and Cicero and and he, he bought those because he wanted to be able to put these things into the hands of people. And as he did, people began to look a little bit differently than they had before about culture and their identity and their ethics, their knowledge and their authority base grew substantially as a result, result of this man securing a lot of the ancient manuscripts and making it available uh, to scholars first, but then to people to know what was in them, okay? So people started to think outside this closed system of Christendom, does that make sense? And they began to look at the world differently through these writers. And then one more influence, a guy by the name of Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus Rotterdamus, 1466 to 1536. Now he was a Dutch philosopher and he was a Catholic theologian. He's an individual that said, okay, here's what we need to do. We need to get back to the original source of the scriptures in their original languages and not depend only on Latin for Bible translation. So he began to revive Bible translation and the doctrines that came out of that, and then consequently the church practices that would come out of that as, a, as he went back to the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts that the uh, scriptures were written in. Now, here's what he had hoped. He is an individual that wanted to reform 
the Catholic Church from within. He had no real desire to abandon the Catholic Church. But like Martin Luther, he wanted to reform it from within because it got too extreme. It, and, you know, um, especially Martin Luther, he just pushed back on indulgences. And these indulgences where you would pay a certain amount of money, you could get your loved one out of purgatory. Okay. Well, it was a way of generating a lot of money is what it was. So he began, Erasmus began to uh, argue against a lot of the empty ritualism and formalism that no longer reflected the teachings of Jesus. And he attacked a lot of the superstitions of the Catholic church. And so he is a very learned individual. He is part of the Renaissance. He is a part of an individual that would like to pull the church into the modern era. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so those three are very influential in moving from the pre-modern to the modern era. So here's my last slide for us tonight. So how do we summarize this? So the Renaissance is kind of this rebirth of humanistic culture, the potential of human beings, and an enhancement of education for all people, not just a select few, not just people um, that are uh, chosen or privileged. And the whole purpose of the Renaissance and the Reformation, and we'll get, we'll talk a little bit more about Refor Reformation next week. Um, its purpose was to rediscover the roots of uh, not only uh, Greek and Roman culture, but to rediscover a lot of what was the basis for European culture. And its desire was to renew society, refresh religious belief and practice. Does that make sense to everybody? So when you hear Renaissance, what you're thinking of is the return of the arts, the return of the study of the great thinkers um, and reform, the desire to reform uh, a period of time that took power away from people and was in the hands of primarily the papacy and the kings. So that's where I'm gonna stop for tonight. Do you have some thoughts, some comments, questions? Does it make sense? It, okay, because here's the point. When we see kind of the making of the modern world, you're gonna see the connection to the making of the American mindset, okay? they're interconnected. And then from the American mindset, we see how it influences the way we look not only at life, but look at the scriptures and God too. Thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? Okay, so I told you this wasn't gonna be as much Bible tonight, even though I referenced a few allusions to Bible. But as we kind of move forward, what we're going to see is uh, individuals like Martin Luther and other reformers will grapple with the Bible. And what you're going to find is that they will, in many ways, struggle with this diverse collection of material. That's why Martin Luther, um, he didn't like Romans. I mean, he loved Romans. He didn't like James, rather. I had that backwards. Why? James says, your faith is by works. We throw that baby out the window because we want, you know, justification by faith alone. So he's going to be very dialed into Galatians and Romans, but he would just as well throw James out the window. Um, so we'll see how that affects their modern mindset will affect uh, how they read the scripture too. Okay. So either I bored you or uh, lost you, uh, but uh, just kind of hold on to, uh, let's go back here to this. If you can just hold on to that, okay? If you can just hold on to that, that will be helpful as we move forward. All right? All right, then what we'll do is we'll close.
uh, at this point for tonight. And uh, good to have you on board and we'll uh, kind of go from there next week, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. All right, have a good rest of the week, everyone. Stay cool. Thank you. All right. You too. All right, bye-bye.